Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we will be talking to Alan Krasowski. He's the VP of Technology and Blockchain at Kiva. Um, and we'll be learning a lot of different things because Kiva is doing plenty of interesting stuff in the identity space. Some very nice um, um, projects they're launching also in Africa that Alan will be telling us more about. And let me quickly summarize what SSI Meetup is about if you're joining for the first time. If you go to the next slide, you will see that, that basically what we're trying to do um, at SSI Meetup is to empower the global SSI community and that helps everyone in a company or person anywhere or just the SSI lover around the world can reuse all the material we are sharing here via SSI Meetup. All this material is shared with the Creative Commons by Share Like License, which basically means you can reuse this material in any way you want. Around the world, the only thing you have to do is to please give credit back to the person creating it, which today is um, the team of Kiva and Alan and SSI Meetup. Uh, so if you reuse the material, you will have access to the Google slide deck, um, a slide share presentation and to the video to review it. And this has been used all over the world. I receive messages from people all over the world that have been using it, which makes me really happy and the whole team of SSI Meetup. So please, please do that because that's one of the reasons why we're um, doing this whole thing in, in the setup. Um, now for the SSI Meetup we have today, as always, if you have any questions, please just jump in. I'll share those questions with Alan. And if not, we can also bring up those questions at the end of this presentation. I especially encourage you to, to do that because the cool thing about doing these webinars in this format is to use all these experts and have access to the brains and be able to ask your questions. So take advantage of that. And that's about it. I think we covered it all. Um, Alan, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to SSI Meetup. Hi, thank you. This is Alan Krasowski. Uh, thanks a lot, Alex. I've I've appreciated SSI Meetup as a resource, and I even mentioned that further down in the slides because I gave a similar presentation to this uh, last month at an Ethereum-based conference. And I lead a technology team um, growing opportunities and scaling financial inclusion around the world. A little bit about Kiva, our mission is to expand financial access and help underserved communities. And some stats about Kiva, uh, we've had uh, about 3.3 million borrowers in 85 countries. These are micro loans that we're giving. Uh, the company's been around for about 14 or 15 years, and Kiva itself is a nonprofit, kind of a leader in micro lending. And we've had almost a couple million people lending out of 192 countries. And a very interesting stat to me when I joined the firm about four months ago was that the repayment rate is about 97%. And um, so that means that borrowers in all parts of the world, even those that don't have access, access to the financial system that we traditionally think of in the Western world, are a pretty good place to put money. And it's a great way to kind of combine charitable giving with uh, lending, and then you get money back from these borrowers and you can lend it out again. I've met people that have recycled money through the Kiva lending system uh, many, many times and get to help a lot of people in the world. So check it out if you haven't heard of Kiva.org in general. Um, we've announced the Kiva protocol project, and the goal there are to provide affordability, accessibility, and accountability to be able to even expand our reach further. Small loans are very costly to give to different places in the world because of the overhead of loans. Um, Banks are highly regulated entities and have to do a lot of paperwork and have to do a lot of filing. So it's kind of difficult for a bank to make a small business loan under $50,000 and still make a profit. We've, we see rural regions of the world that are drastically underserved. And then it's very hard for people to build up credit worthiness, proof of credit worthiness, because um, in the areas where they're kind of underserved by the financial industry in general, it's hard, even when they pay back Kiva, to then take the portability of that and go to a bank and say, look, I've paid back a Kiva loan, and banks don't really understand how to, how to grok that information. So we've got some challenges in financial integrity uh, on this slide, and we've got on the planet right now, of the seven and a half or so billion of us, about a billion people have no way to prove their identity. Half of those are in Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa and then another 300 or so million uh, in Asia. So Kiva is setting out to help solve some of these challenges. And our first uh, area that we're working in is Sierra Leone. <clears throat> They've had a credit bureau that only served about 2,000 people in a country that's got uh, close to 7 billion people 
5.1 or so billion, uh, million adults. We're doing this project in cooperation with the government of Sierra Leone, the banking system of Sierra Leone. And that leads to, because we have these partnerships and we've been working in a lot of countries like Sierra Leone, in Sierra Leone for a long time, we can get to systems that kind of integrate uh, the existing banking systems and help serve people better using some of these newer technologies that have been brought about by cryptography and lately self-sovereign identity. Uh, I grew up, you know, I was born in the late 60s, and my brother used to play this album a lot when I was pretty young. This album came out in 1978, Who Are You? As I was looking for some background slides, I noticed the chair in the center of this album says, Not to be taken away. I think that's an important point. I never noticed that when I was a kid growing up. Uh, this summer, I was listening to music with friends at a bar and heard this song from a band called Queens of the Stone Age. Do you know who you really are? Are you sure it's really you? And the way the line is sung, it has a nice melody to it, and it really stuck in my head uh, this past summer. I've been thinking about it a lot. A little bit about me. Um, you know, I was, I was born, I was given a name by my parents. The first 20 or so years, I wouldn't have been making any uh, self seven identity kind of claims that anybody should have trusted. But in my adult life, I've been a professional software developer for many years. Uh, a large part of that, I was working in anti-malware and cybersecurity. Some of that overlapped uh, with Daniel Hardman, um, who's, who's given SSI meetup talks before. We talked about how a lot of people in this space come from a cybersecurity background. I've got some background in fintech. In fintech. I've really gotten into blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, since about 2017, so a bit late to that party, but a very focused effort. I was looking at consensus for a while. And I was thinking back to, I'm very relatively new to the identity space in particular, but in the early 2000s, I was working on some anti-spam measures that were trying to at least uh, cap the amount of uh, spam that was hitting email networks at that time. And then there was some voice uh, imprinting, uh, voice recognition software that was doing unlocking identity when I was at McAfee slash Intel Security. So as I came to this space, I had been working at Consensus right before Kiva, and I started trying to understand the identity standards and what was happening on different blockchain-related technologies and what was happening uh, in this SSI space. And this is how I felt trying to untangle things uh, with all these acronyms and all these things to go explore and different ways that different teams were doing things. And this is what I wanted to try to do is to untangle things. So one resource that really helped me is uh, this book, which is available as an, e as an e book from Heather and Kalaya. We're pretty well known in the space. The book is uh, close to like, maybe a year and a half or so old at this point. And hopefully there'll be an, an update because this space has been moving really quickly. But that's one resource I can recommend for people who are, who are new to the space like I was not that, or not that long ago. I recall seeing documents or diagrams like this up until, yeah, I think this one's from 2008, where in the pre-blockchain era, there was always a centralized party in the middle that was kind of coordinating things. And in this case, it was the identity provider and something that both parties could trust. And I've seen different people take stabs at, you know, eras of identity and digital identity in particular. So this might not satisfy everyone and people have their different takes on it. But from, from my point of view, coming at the space relatively recently, it seems like we've got this uh, federated ID system and we've got a lot of people using single sign-on right now with namespaces of IDs that are controlled by corporations. They might hand you a uh, Twitter handle or an email address, but they really own the domain of where that ID is, is going to be functioning. And then they made it easy for developers to kind of just do a single line of code and use that uh, system to use a Jot or something that they give you a little token and you can log into different websites. But this has led to some pretty um, abhorrent uh, systems of surveillance capitalism, which just, you know, if you've read any of these books, uh, you understand the power that some of the big com bank companies have right now on the planet. And this is the kind of thing I want to move us away from, and I think a lot of people do as well. This kind of attracted me to some of the SSI concepts uh, in particular. 
This slide is actually um, from Heather and Kalaya's book, and uh, John Phillips did the mapping, but I was at a Uport talk um, at a Ethereum DevCon event, and um, uh, Johnny Howell did a presentation of uh, the, the 10 principles of self-sovereign identity on the right. Uh, and John Phillips mapped these back to 2005, so the understanding of what we need in digital identity you know, digital identity kind of goes way back, and it's nice to study the history and get some of the philosophy and the aspects that one might need to think about, some of which might be counterintuitive. But you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants here in terms of thinking about this stuff in a really deep way. And I'm not claiming to be uh, as original as, a, as I mean, as, as these guys. Um, but there's a lot to learn here, and then there's a lot of advances that have happened in the 11 years between these two uh, kind of ways of looking at identity. I started looking at the origin of the term self-sovereign identity a bit and found the original blog post and I was surprised at the time to learn that it actually referenced a, a uh, post by co-authored by Christian Lungfist and people that I had been working with at Consensus. So the space, you know, while it first seems big is then kind of relatively small if you Start learning who who the players have been and how they're coming about, you know, what their solutions do and, and how they work together, and things might be congealing. It's an interesting notion of how uh, Devin put it in terms of really ascribing a lot of power to a capable adult individual. And I, I kind of think of self sovereign identity as uh, having these types of properties or inheriting this kind of space, which is. Um, the independent, you know, self-sovereign uh, individual. So it involves did, it involves did, uh, did off, verified claims, these kinds of things. Um, and there's plenty of SSI meetup talks in the past that have explored lots of these issues. I think it's interesting in particular that the Evernet and Sovereign teams have been looking about looking at non-correlatability of um, handing out dids to different entities and not allowing them to kind of create a social graph for you. That reminded me of some of the spam, anti-spam solutions from the early 2000s where you would just give a different email address to every person you met. Apple is currently helping uh, their customers manage that kind of a system right now. Uh, Craigslist has done that, for example, when you're responding to ads. I've always thought that part was interesting. Uh, and I, for this group, usually on SSI Meetup, there's plenty of other slides or plenty of other prior talks that go into this a bit. This kind of diagram was helpful for me. This is again from uh, Heather and Kalia's book, but it shows issuers and wallets and verifiers and what, what would go on a ledger and um, some aspects of decentralized key management systems. This is a slide from Phil Windley. Again, I'm going to blow through these pretty quickly because I have a lot of sli other slides to get to that might be more uh, unique or things you haven't heard about SSI before. And I also reference that I like uh, the very host of this presentation right here. So again, I think there's 36 other presentations that I'd encourage people to check out. And also people have done some very, uh, like Michael Herman, have done some very interesting uh, detailed diagrams for those architects who are used to looking at you know, UML reference diagrams and just understanding concepts at kind of a deep level. The Uport team from Consensus has been hard at work for a long time and has gone through a few iterations. I think I saw this morning that they're also six days away from announcing uh, either their major new architecture or just unveiling kind of all the work that they've been doing for the last several months. I'm looking forward to that. Notice that they've pivoted from uh, the way that they describe the did method and they've been moving more towards kind of a universal accepted way of doing things. They've been working with the W3C standards have, as have others. And that, that's encouraging. In fact, when I was on Twitter and saw some of um, this kind of these teams talking to each other and talking about open standards and Pal and Trent and Jamie kind of just referring to the fact that if we have open standards with coming out of a group like the W3C, we're going to have interoperability. So it might not matter what blockchain uh, you subscribe to. You might be able to get some interoperability even across blockchain ecosystems. In fact, um, it was Stephen Curran who was on an Ares, Hyperledger Ares working group call when I saw him give this slide presentation. We 
where on the left side, uh, I had seen presentations from folks like Drummond and the Evan and Sovereign crew that just always kind of assumed uh, a blockchain at, at the base layer on the left side, where what Stephen was presenting was kind of a different way of looking at it in the Aries code, where blockchain support would be a pluggable thing that you could add to the code base. And you might want to support several different types of systems that may be backed by a blockchain or other kind of immutable data store. And that uh, was more attractive to me again, because we're just going to have people in different regions or for different reasons picking uh, their own kind of uh, blockchain technologies to go with. I was also encouraged by this type of presentation from Daniel Hardman that to me started getting out of uh, the concept of self-sovereign identity, uh, meaning that self-sovereign identity assumes kind of a, a capable adult of it can do things for themselves. It has the means by which to generate, store, transact, can store a, a bit of entropy and keep that as, a, as private key information. It has a place to do that. It's got perhaps good internet access. They can send transactions across. But Dan's been thinking about, uh, Daniel's been thinking about, um, and the sovereign working groups have been thinking about places and times where that might not be the case. So we, we've got guardianship and delegation. Uh, as more first-class citizens in the conversation about, about how we handle identity. And I won't go through all of Daniel's slides, but I encourage you to look at his recent talk from July this year that goes through how these things can get proxied and how we can have uh, guardianship and delegate models and what those limits might need to be and uh, all the parameters and dimensions of the problem with a lot of examples to go through. Uh, and walk through and understand how that might work if you're in a refugee camp, for example. So that was getting closer to what Kiva, you know, the on the ground stuff in uh, the developing world that doesn't have all the services that most of the folks working in self sovereign identity have had the luxury of having. I've also been really interested in work that recent work that Austin Griffith has been doing on Ethereum, and that is kind of on the fly generating an ephemeral key pair before anybody has a real account on Ethereum that might cost gas, but just generating that in the browser, this is for the onboarding process. Uh, and uh, even developing and attaching a few behaviors and things that the user within a web page has done so far, such that if they get to the point where they actually do want to create a real Ethereum address, then you can attach the ephemeral stuff to that and it becomes more permanent. Instead of requiring someone to uh, create an Ethereum account just to do anything on that platform. And uh, Daniel Buckner has also done some presentations, including um, in, this, um, in this venue. And it's pretty fascinating because that he and that team at Microsoft and others on, on this have thought a lot about scale. And if we're talking about systems that get out to billions of people on the planet, it's not going to be the same kind of single transactions that take a lot of compute power each. And that team's also thought about storage and anchoring to the blockchain and you know, getting things down to maybe a single hash that goes on a blockchain that represents a lot of data in a Merkle tree proof or something like this. We also have agents and routing agents that can talk to each other and the cloud communication can get pretty complex. It's nice to see uh, the ND teams talking about this kind of complexity that these systems are needed in future systems. We've got uh, people on Twitter that are critiquing the current language that's used by the SSI community. Here's one that I thought was particularly interesting from Adam uh, Migas in that he's making the case that it's, it's confusing to say that, the, that just because the data subject and the custodian of data are the same, means that they that entity or that person is the owner of the data it's just two roles there's lots of literature that goes back and this is someone who's kind of skeptical in the whole blockchain space from from what i gather from his tweets but i'm trying to get a perspective on this not just from people who've been in the ssi world but also how others might think about it or critique it We've also seen in, uh, in the recent couple of weeks, uh, Kalaya has posted a few things that other folks from the Evernim or Sovereign team might take issue with on, on how factual they are. Um, and so what we have here is it's not a pure technology. There is some politics involved. There's some tribal aspects of human nature involved. So getting to the truth of how systems work or should work is the subject of debate and I think ongoing discussion. 
I'm looking forward to Internet Identity Workshop next week. A lot of there's venues like that and like this that bring people together that define commonalities and figure out how and when they can work together and agree what the truth is. And even this morning when I woke up, uh, Cal had seen that I was tagged to give this talk and expressed some concerns about biometrics. And uh, I responded back and I've encouraged people to read that thread, comment on that thread, and uh, maybe we can discuss it at the upcoming IIW. And Pell and I are also going to be at an upcoming Ethereum uh, DevCon in, in Japan in a couple weeks. So I'm hoping to discuss, discuss this with him face to face. So coming back to the phases, um, I like to think of uh, kind of a coming phase with interoperability as something that's more important than declaring independence within my, within my universe or my one universe of identity, because it recognizes that we're going to have multiple ways to think about identity. We're going to have multiple tribes who believe there's a certain way to go about doing identity or getting identity uh, you know, handled, for example. And I think it's encouraging to look at what the W3C is doing in the space to define standards of ways of uh, communicating data formats related to identity. And it's encouraging to look at projects like ARIES that are taking inspiration from, you know, if you'd asked me a few years ago, would it be a, a province in Canada that would be leading the way on identity technology? I just wouldn't have seen it or predicted it. But from some of the work that BC Gov is doing, it's, it's very, uh, it's got a lot of thought leadership and it's kind of well thought through and it's, it's impressive. So there's a lot of good work going on in the, uh, in the Linux foundation, uh, in Hyperledger in particular, and adhering to the emerging W3C standards. And I, I salute all the people that have been doing all the hard work there. I'm just kind of, you know, overviewing it here pretty quickly. Some of the goals of, uh, how we're approaching this at Kiva, include, like I just mentioned, supporting the emerging standards. We are both leveraging and committing back to open source projects, including uh, some of the ones I'll mention, I think, in the next slide or two. But we're currently uh, contributing um, back to ARIES, uh, possibly URSA, and, and looking at Indy as well, because we're making use of those technologies. We want to empower individuals with tools to help prove their identity, help prove their credit history, as I mentioned. There are times when visiting a bank, like in a country like Sierra you know, Leone, where it might take two weeks currently just to kind of get a match back on someone manually looking at fingerprints. Um, I'll get into what the government has been doing there, but there are times when it shouldn't take several weeks to open a bank account. And if you're an entrepreneur in that country, just trying to have a place to put your money and not just be hoarding cash. Um, <clears throat> so we want to reduce those, those times and save time for users. We want to respect the privacy of users and uh, generally minimize the amount of data we, we put on chain. Uh, there was a hyperledger talk that Daniel Hardman gave, I believe it was last year, where he kind of described his blockchain journey. And once he discovered blockchains, he wanted to sprinkle their magic everywhere, but has come to a point realizing the overhead of these things and uh, how slow they can be, how expensive they can be. So putting kind of a minimal amount of data on a blockchain necessary to prove the point, it might be a roll up of a bunch of hashes but at least it, it's a truth that everyone uh, looking at that system, if it has sufficient security, can agree on. It can be kind of a truth machine upon which we base um, other parts of the system and remove that centralized aspect. So here are some Hyperledger projects that Kiva is involved with and looking at. The most recent one is Desu, which is an enterprise Ethereum client written in Java. Uh, these other ones have different languages involved. You know, there might be some Rust, there might be some C. Um, and, you know, the, the important part is that they're all Apache 2 licensed. Uh, they're all kind of friendly to taking community uh, uh, enhancements and upgrades and, you know, debating about their merits, of course. But it's a growing community of people in the open source space under the auspices of the Linux Foundation uh, developing software for others to build upon as well. So Kiva is contributing to that. I was at a conference recently, and as a joke, the MC was trying to get people to vote on Slido through their phones on, on a contentious topic. But he happened to make the offhand remark, if you don't have a device, what are you doing here? And it wasn't particularly elitist, and it wasn't particularly um, 
a comment, you know, it was everybody there was pretty high tech and it was, it was at Microsoft and Redmond. So of course, a lot of people had a lot of cell phones on them. Uh, but it made me think uh, relative to this project because not everybody who we're trying to help at Kiva has a cell phone or has access to high speed internet when they have one um, or even has access to uh, power to help recharge their phone when they need to. I see ads like this from HTC Exodus that are using the language that I used earlier about uh, surveillance capitalists and being the vanguard of decentralization. So I'm seeing commercial entities like cell phone manufacturers use this language. They're embedding better tools, perhaps, you know, with TEE environments on the phone itself, a place to put private keys. And, and that's, all, that's all wonderful. But uh, there are a lot of people on the planet that don't have access to this kind of technology. And Kiva wants to help them, too. So many of our borrowers lack computers and smartphones. Um, what do we do? How, what parts of SSI break down when the end user doesn't have a physical device? I was encouraged by Daniel Hardman uh, sending me this paper he wrote a couple of years ago, I believe, saying, uh, on Paper Sovereign that had a proposal for uh, how to help people in refugee camps establish some form of uh, an identity that would only be based on a piece of paper and combining QR codes in a certain uh, random order and only having a certain amount of devices uh, in the local environment. But it would still allow things like, you know, prevent someone from taking someone else's meal, for example, or lead to, lead to being able to establish uh, relationships between a mother and her child uh, and establish that guardianship relationship, et cetera. So I think if Daniel has shared that, or can share that wildly or publicly, um, widely, then I encourage people to go read that who are interested. Uh, it sounded to me like he'd be willing to share that with, with anybody who's interested. We've got other constraints in the environment that we're working in. Uh, like I mentioned, there is some, just in the central city of Freetown, there are some limits on bandwidth and electricity. Power goes out pretty often. And so it's an environment that's kind of tough to be always on. You need to take backups of data pretty regularly to make sure that you can deal with the uh, offline situation. So I can pause there. I don't know if there's any questions so far, Alex. I figured you might have interrupted me if, if there were, but. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's okay right now. Okay, I'll continue with my rapid fire presentation. Um, <clears throat> you might have seen this week, uh, Aaron Goldsmith, our VP of product, was just interviewed and talking about a lot of the um, a lot of the topics going on this week at the UN General Assembly uh, involve the types of you know fintech solutions that Kiva is trying to bring and ex expanding our ability to give microloans worldwide. And you know, I, we'll have some announcements coming out of our work that we've been doing at the UN this week. To give an update uh, a bit on what we've done in 2019, we issued uh, 5 million blockchain wallets. We did our first uh, Know Your Customer check at a commercial bank in Sierra Leone that connected up, and I'll go through some slides on this, connected up some biometrics with an existing system the government already had to streamline the ability for a bank to prove that it knows who it's dealing with, which is a very important uh, regulatory issue uh, pretty much around the world in, in the era of anti-terrorism and anti-money laundering kinds of laws. And we are on track to do our first credit right to a ledger uh, later this year. A little bit Just about what the fingerprint system looks like. Go one ahead. One question, um, Alan. Just from Marie, um, that's like related to the previous slide, I think. It's about, uh, she's saying about how, how are you thinking about privacy for sensitive data like ZK SNARKs or hybrid closed permission systems with permissionless governance? Um, we are taking privacy, we, we want privacy preserving aspects of the system to be there as much as possible. Uh, we want to make it hard for people to steal other people's identities. Um, I don't know that I can mention, I guess I, I'm not understanding the question enough to know that I can answer anything specific about Sparks and Starks, for example, but just you know, privacy preserving technologies and privacy you know, preserving compute has been an interest of mine for a few years now. And 
I think it's important to consider. Uh, there's also potentially a lot of a lot of compute overhead as well, so that you factor it into the architecture in terms of you know, how things can scale, et cetera. But that's a, about as good as an answer as I can give at the moment. Okay. Yeah. May, maybe maybe we, we can bring up this question with more detail at the end of the session if you want to. Okay. If if, if you have some some more follow up on that, and then we can just continue. Okay. Yeah, happy to discuss that that more. Um, uh, let me go through a few steps of how we're doing um, fingerprint identification. So, so first, I should preface this with the. It was my answer to Pell this morning. Um, maybe people don't understand this bit. Uh, the Sierra Leone government had uh, taken fingerprints of five million citizens. And they did that before Kiva arrived. So that's sitting in the central repository currently that the government you know, has and is, is, can use as an identity system uh, in that country. The banking system uh, to date has not really been hooked up to that though. So when some, someone arrives at a bank and wants to get something done, the bank needs to prove that they know who that person is, you know, which citizen that is. And so some of the systems that we've developed initially help, help in that respect. Um, so we we are hooking up an indie wallet uh, which has been seeded by this national citizen registry database and the fingerprint scan can then confirm that the person sitting live in front of a bank teller or a bank employee is the person they claim to be you know that does match to the national id number that they are presenting who they are uh, which helps the bank then you know, satisfy this you know, live in-person proof that this is the person presenting uh, this biometric. Uh, as a second step, uh, lending, lending history can be presented to a potential lender. And <clears throat> this is going to be a way to kind of consolidate uh, all the loans that are currently outstanding to a citizen so that a new bank can make a decision, you know, where are they at? in terms of credit, what is the risk score here, or does it, or do we have overlays on the suggested, uh, as banks tend to do with their own, managing their own risk profiles. Um, so in this country, uh, there was less than 2,000 citizens that uh, the Central Credit Bureau had uh, cross-bank lending information on. And obviously that's a lot less than 5 million people who are eligible for getting financial services. So we're helping scale that system out and uh, helping banks and financial providers and small lenders in country get a better handle on how much um, debt and how much credit obligation uh, people have when they present themselves. And then as repayments are made, and uh, I believe the data on this page is made up, um, but as, as repayments are made, um, writing into a credit ledger like this on paper has been the way that many banks in the country have done it. And this you know, might work, but it also introduces uh, human error into the, just, into the jotting down of things. Um, it doesn't really necessarily give the, uh, the borrower a proof that they can you know, take somewhere else that yes, they repaid you know, this on, on, on a monthly payment, for example. And so kind of upgrading the system to modern, more modern technology and being able to store repayment data in a credit ledger that you can, you can prove that the bank you know, agreed that you paid back this amount on this date uh, for this loan or you closed out this loan and it was paid for on time, those kinds of things, are, are great tools to be able to give people when they're actually managing their credit wisely. And so, when someone you know takes out a loan from uh, an institution and pays it back on time, the data surrounding that is kind of you know it's a little bit owned. Getting back to that uh, critique I mentioned earlier, it's kind of it's data in there that it's about both the bank and the person who borrowed. Um, so the end user has sovereignty over data that's that's theirs, but there's also information out there that is applicable to them, you know, getting future loans. And we also we also have to in any system like this think about what bad actors might do. Uh, people might try to open lots of loans at the same time. They might, you know, peer-to-peer -peer loan to each other in an organized crime setting and then all bust out of the system. And those are traditionally hard things to go detect. 
Um, but being able to prove that you've been, you know, kind of uh, on good faith acting within the system um, is an interesting property we're trying to trying to bring here. But people do have to have some amount of trust in institutions uh, to, to to lend them money to go do things that are typically entrepreneurial in our in our lending in our borrowing community. And let's see, we've got immutably, uh, immutability that can ensure trust in otherwise uh, low trust environments. This is just speaking to um, the trust that if, enough, if a lot of other conditions are there and are satisfied, we can put trust in blockchains instead of having to trust in uh, centralized parties. Now, granted, we are helping bootstrap the system. And so one of the reasons governments and banks and uh, borrowers and lenders trust in Kiva is because Kiva has been around as a nonprofit for about 15 years and it's generally shown itself to be a good world citizen um, in, in helping bring idle capital to places that need it and show that you know, it's possible to invest in certain parts of the world that have been underinvested in and people there have a generally uh, same kinds of values and um, want the same kinds of things uh, to make their lives better that they do in other places. It's just that they've been, they've been underserved so far. So if we can set up the right conditions under which these kinds of blockchain-based identity solutions can, can thrive, then we'll get to a, a better way of using the current technologies to empower people. At least that's my, that's my hope and that's my belief. And you can talk about some scenarios that um, might be less than ideal. For example, this slide goes through someone that's in a minority a minority population and tries, you know, and is fleeing. And maybe the government uh, of the oppressive uh, majority population tries to revoke ID cards and tries to erase banking details. Um, when you have an immutable credit ledger that is transnational, um, you as a as an individual, as long as your um, biometrics remain intact, you might be able to pop up somewhere else in the world and kind of restore access to information that can prove parts of your history um, to enable you to kind of just not show up as if you were just born, uh, but be able to show some aspect of your prior identity and maybe your good credit. That means your credit history can follow you across borders. Um, that means that despite your you know, government coup or whatever it was that you know, tried to oppress people. This can give people uh, power to kind of fight back and have unrepealable data. Um, <clears throat> how this works in practice? You know, there's a lot of devil in devil in, in the details here, and some more devil devil in the details of just the realities and you know on the ground challenges that we're facing. So I've mentioned a few of these. And to sum up, we've got hardware-free sovereignty. We've got people that don't necessarily have smartphones or ways to carry around compute power and storage with them all the time. There's challenges of data access. There's challenges of delay tolerance due to systems being down at times. And uh, there's just needing to educate people on you know, how current technologies can improve things. Uh, this is also an opportunity, though, to, to leapfrog in the same way that you didn't have to necessarily lay copper wires in parts of the world to get faster cell phone service than, you know, for example, the U.S. And I think we have the opportunity to leapfrog many of the concepts that might be taken for granted in the current, you know, kind of fintech Western world and introduce technologies based on cryptography and blockchain that might might do well and might accelerate the pace of financial inclusion in places like Africa that you might not have expected it without these technologies emerging in the last few years. Going forward, I mentioned that we are in discussions at the UN, this General Assembly this week. We expect to roll out in different geographies uh, besides Sierra Leone within 2020. Currently, credit a credit check of someone because a lot of things are so manual ends up about cost costing about a dollar thirty in Sierra Leone. With some of the technologies we're bringing to bear, we're hoping to get that down a couple orders of magnitude uh, to pennies. 
which should uh, free up and provide, you know, demonstrate the ability that investing in this space and you know, kind of um, bringing the cost down and the overhead down of being able to, to give loans to people and do credit checks should result in more capital being freed up and be able to be put to good use in the area. We also believe that we'll have solutions for uh, migrants and we have a special capital fund dedicated uh, at this kind of part of the problem. Before I close, I wanted to mention that uh, the Kiva staff for the Kiva Protocol Project is hiring. There is part of the team of us in San Francisco a few weeks ago. This doesn't include some of the folks who are on the ground uh, in Sierra Leone, some of the folks who are uh, at, at the UN today, but it, it shows that um, once in a while we're able to get together. It's a pretty fast moving mission driven project. It's real world. It's going to have real impact on people uh, throughout the world. And remote work is available. So please contact me or go onto the Kiva careers page if you're interested in any of the stuff I just mentioned. One thing in particular I'd like to show is the values of this company. So I showed you my career history of you know, three decades of working in, in, with computers and with software. This is my first nonprofit I've ever worked for. And it's the first also company I've worked for that has values like this that are, that are lived. And some of them, you know, might just sound like corporate speak. But the executive team takes them to heart. People take them to heart. Our Slack messages are filled with kind of love and kindness messages. It's a nice, people are nice to each other and thinking about how to approach inclusion and equity and diversity in the, workforce, in the workforce and having mature adult uh, civil conversations about these things. And it's, it's really nice. Um, so I just thought I'd mention these. And if any of these resonate with you, that would just be an extra uh, bonus for you to kind of seek out uh, coming and helping, helping work with us. So that is the end of the presentation. If uh, if there's questions for the end here, I'll, I'm happy to take those now, and I'm happy to take things you know, offline. I'm on uh, I'm available uh, on Twitter. I'm available uh, with an email that I'm not sure I put in this deck, but I'm Alan K at Kiva.org. And let's go to awesome. questions, Alex. Awesome, Alan. Thank you so much. Um, question here from Jimmy. Um, he's asking. Are you going to open up your SSI platform to other organizations as an API? How can we utilize what you're building? Uh, great question. So our intention is to give APIs to our partners uh, in, in the banking system within the countries that we're working in. I expect that we will be producing protocols that other people can use. I mentioned that we are contributing back to open source projects. Part of what we're trying to do with our current APIs is kind of abstract some of the low-level blockchain-y things. Like we don't we don't think that uh, it should necessarily be promoting any particular blockchain. Again, we're trying to uh, subscribe to W3C standards here, and you know we'll we'll promote those standards. Um, we're trying to stay away from at the moment stay away from any kind of uh, token-based or ICO-based blockchain system, which is another nice thing about Hyperledger. It's all uh, pure in that sense. That there's no there's no tokens floating around any of those systems. It's whoever's running the nodes is paying for the cost of running the nodes. That may change in the future if the world kind of coincides on or uh, you know, condenses down to supporting you know the one smart contract uh, blockchain system, for example, or the one identity system. But I think uh, uh, jury's still out on, on those kinds of things, but to the, to the question about APIs in particular, we have nothing to share publicly yet, but we are working on APIs and we're internally uh, have our own APIs. We're going through some security audits on things right now and uh, we we'll hope to publish uh, some APIs publicly, you know, likely in 2020, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, um, I have John is asking here, can you share a little bit more about your architecture? Will you be building on Hyperledger Indy or what, what is the architecture of, um, that you will be using to, to or that, or that you're using for your solution? We have been building on Hyperledger Indy. Um, we are also um, tracking with Aries and by virtue of bringing in Aries also Ursa. 
and uh, we have we have begun some prototyping and experimentation on Hyperledger Basu as well. I didn't include an architecture diagram here. I might be able to come back and kind of show you uh, in a future talk, you know, exactly how things work once we've got uh, more externally publishable documentation. Okay, but what what kind of network are you planning to run? I mean, who will be running the the nodes? And um, I mean, I mean, if it's blockchain, if it has a blockchain blockchain flavor, is this something like that, or is it um, is it a closed network? Uh, for the short term vision, it will be a private permission network. Um, I I can't tell you yet who will be there running the nodes, but it will not just be Kiva. Okay. Um, Jimmy is asking, I'm in the real estate space and just got back from Kenya. I would like to use your, um, your identity to help solve some of the issues of property ownership. Thank you. Okay. So, Jimmy, um, if, um, if you want to be connected to Alan, just write an email to contact at ssimedup.org and, um, and if Alan is okay with that, I can connect you guys. Um, Sounds good to me. Okay. And um, here, and there's um, Daniel asking, how, how was the experience um, of disentangling um, identity? Um, um, how, how did you differentiate all the different things? <laughs> how was my experience of disentangling identity? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess um, it's not fully disentangled in my own head yet. There's, there's a lot of information. Uh, out there to kind of absorb and understand and um, like I mentioned kind of toward the beginning of the talk there's some competing ideas and there's some you know it can be hard to kind of get to the truth people can use different terms and mean the same thing or um, use the same term and mean different things uh, depending on the, the identity ecosystem that one is looking at and so it's an, it's an evolving journey I guess uh, I'd say it's uh, uh more more less tangled than uh, it was when I came to it as a, as my own mental models. Um, I think I pointed to some of the resources that have helped me um, understand the space a bit more. Um, not sure I can give a succinct uh, description of you know how disentangled I got things in my own head or with the team, but uh, I think we we understand what our needs are within our environment and we've been helping other people understand that the world and the users and the way that they've been thinking about identity might not include some of these use cases. So I think it's an ongoing conversation and you know, venues like this and IIW and RWOT, et cetera, are places to kind of continue that global conversation. Let me ask it for myself in a different way. Like because I mean, you're clearly someone who has a lot of experience in technology. So it's not like, oh my God, I, I don't know how to program or how to look at an architecture. And um, when you come to the space, because I mean, I, I'm saying it, I don't have a tech background myself, but I've been in the space now for only three years. So, but I, I think the like learning curve is pretty steep. So, what would be your recommendation about um, what, or what do you think are like the most complicated things to understand when you come to this? Even if you're educated to, you know, from a tech and you have a tech background, and um, what, what, what do you think are the biggest challenges that someone should be looking out for? Always look, look if you understand this, this will help you understand everything else in a much easier way. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, for, for me, there was aspects of crypto economics that when I was at consensus, uh, I had to spend a lot of time because there's, there's game theory, there's mechanism design behind it. And while I had been used to kind of putting the black hat and think on and thinking like an attacker, uh, there's financial incentives involved when there's, when there's blockchains involved and often, um, and that's an interesting thing to think through. I had been around uh, cryptography and cryptographers for several years in the, kind of the cybersecurity space, understood, you know, Diffie-Hellman exchange or understood kind of the basics of HTTPS um, and how that works. But that didn't prepare me for uh, about two years ago this time. I was at an Ethereum conference and it was a full day on ZK Starks and Snarks and how some of these zero knowledge proofs work. And it just, you know, blew my mind because it was totally new to me that we could do things um, 
that are enabled by this kind of privacy preserving compute. I can prove to you, you know, some aspects of a system without revealing other facts about the system. And it was counterintuitive and it was kind of using math. Uh, other things, um, you know, like threshold signatures are just, they're tough to get your head around. I think they're even tougher to get your head around when you know a little bit about computing. If you didn't know anything, you could just say, oh, okay, so if this, num this number of people out of those people sign this thing, then it's valid. You know, but trying to understand at a, at a code level or a math level how that works, um, you know, is potentially really difficult because you've got a, you've got a follow white paper and have close to a PhD level understanding and cryptography uh, on some of this stuff. And it's some of it's very, very new technologies. Um, so, you know, some of my own advice might be slightly tainted to those that don't have my background trying to understand this stuff, but those were the areas that were kind of hard for me. Um, I think the security properties of say the Bitcoin network or uh, Ethereum, some of that I see still in active discussion. You know, there was a very large transfer of Bitcoin uh, maybe two or so weeks ago. And there was arguments for several days about how many days that person would have to wait to make sure that the transfer actually uh, wasn't going to get reorged uh, because miners might have incentives to actually rewrite the chain. And so a word like immutability is not entirely accurate. Um, there are de there's degrees of this and there's granularity of this. And that goes true for kind of any blockchain. The nodes have to come to consensus. What what are the incentives on each node to kind of be good actors versus try to attack the system? There's 51 percent attacks. I'm, I'm kind of just listing a lot of the uh, the aspects of all these things that even make it more complex. And I know your question was about how to kind of boil it down or simplify it in your head. Um, it's I think it's kind of inherently complex. I think um, groups like the W3C standards and defining terms and defining exactly what we mean when we say these terms in these contexts are good, just helping you know, get a lexicon going that everyone can kind of agree on. It's maybe somewhat neutral to uh, a blockchain system that's being used. Um, I also think that um, you know better documentation on some of the open source projects that we're using to explain things to you know, in, in analogy, this, they're always going to be slightly imperfect, but just getting people to have mental models, models about these things and to be able to reason about them kind of correctly or properly is, um, is important. And so I think there could be more of a focus on, on that. Uh, not sure I have any more off the cuff advice on increasing the understandability of the stuff. I think some of it just comes with, as we were talking before the call, Alex, that you, you might need to read a book two or three times to kind of really get it. And that's been the case for me, certainly in this space. Um, and I, it just might be that way. And maybe the next generation will have, you know, start from a better uh, footing and have things more concisely explained to them in, in ways that make more sense. Great, thank you. This qu question here from Daniel, he's asking, um, Daniel Ongunhao from the Enable team, and he's asking, does Kiva Identity have any projects in Southeast Asia? Uh, hey, Daniel. Um, <laughs> meant to read back, reach back out to you and connect this week, uh, because we had a nice chat, a beginning of a chat on Twitter. Um, I've been following what his hackathon project has been doing um, and it's very interesting because it's kind of replicating some of what Archiva Marketplace does but on the Ethereum ecosystem. So it's an interesting project. Um, uh, I, the, only, the only part of Keeper Protocol I can talk about is what's going on in Sierra Leone right now. So uh, that's what I'm privy to talk to uh, to speak about on this call. Okay, thank you. All right, last question for me. I mean, as you think about this, and before we started this webinar, we also spoke about this. Um, um, like identity and 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 money um, kind of comes together in this project you're doing in Sierra Leone. How how do you envision this happening in the future? Because like if um, if, if identity and and money as it exists gets really intermingled in a strong way in in, in these kind of networks. Um, um, what is your opinion or what is your view today about 
the effects that might have or how that, that might work? I know it's a very open-ended question, but maybe you have some some thoughts about that. Um, yeah, it's a pretty open philosophical question. I guess, you know, I guess one answer would be that, that identity and money and money are, are never are never completely separated. Uh, maybe you could say money and everything else in the world are somewhat always related. Um, but you know, if you've got an identity system and someone is running it, uh, there's money that's powering you know at least electricity behind it and you know the running of servers somewhere. Uh, whether that's you know donated money or whether that's you know, governments working on, you know, it also costs money to run banks. It costs money to print dollar bills or any other currency. And um, it costs money to print, you know, ID cards, et cetera. It may be relatively cheap to generate a private public key pair that one might use as part of an identity system. Um, but there's at least going to be some kind of internet oil or gas or, or, or a token to run a system. And so money's going to be involved. And then when money's being lent out like this, someone's making interest on it. I mentioned early in the call that uh, Kiva is a nonprofit, yet our partners you know, do charge interest. They have to have people going out, let's say, on a moped and meeting a farmer in a field. And all that takes time and effort and resources. And those people and those resources have to be compensated. Um, so uh, I guess it's good food for thought, you know. Uh, I guess don't think about any identification system as being wholly separate from money uh, to begin with. The world's just not, you know, the world's more, what's the word, intertwingled, I guess, than that. Thank you. Maybe that's no, a good thanks. good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's open-ended. Um, just... Um, Two questions coming up here from, from Marie. She's saying, this was excellent. Thank you so much. She has another question that I will answer now. And um, also, she was also asking, what, what's the name of the book from Heather and Kalia? Maybe you can show that slide again. Um, I think it was one oh, of the initial sure. slides. Sure, yeah. Uh, it's called a guide, I believe it's called a guide to self-sovereign identity. It's available on Amazon as an ebook. Uh, wow, I had a lot of slides. Yeah, it was one of the early ones uh, right at the beginning, I think. There we go. Yeah, a Comprehensive Guide to Self-Sovereign Identity. Yeah, excellent. So that's the book, Marie. Um, Alan, thank you so much. A any final thoughts from you about something you would like to share or add to, to what you said already? I guess to follow on this, I mean, I uh, maybe as um, compensation, <laughs> To compensate that I kind of took Kalia to task for some of her tweets recently. Another recent tweet of Kalia's, she was at the Identity 2020 conference, was she gave a long list of resources that backed up her talk. And that is in a tweet that I don't have in the slides, but I would suggest following her, Kalia Identity Woman Young, uh, on Twitter. And she's got some good resources there. And she goes back uh, a long time in this space, knows pretty much all the players. and. Um, is a very uh, knowledgeable person in the space and has produced some good resources and background material to help people get up to speed. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, yeah, so for everyone else, um, this is it for today. Um, thank you so much, Alan, for, for your time and sharing what, what Kiva's doing, which I think will be really interesting. If you, um, Marie, you had one question if this will be recorded. Yes, it will be recorded and shared um, um, right after this. Uh, webinar maybe today maybe tomorrow you will have access to the google slides you will have access to the recording on youtube and you will have access to slideshow um, and you have the same for all the other um, ssi meetups we've been doing so far um, next one's coming up um, are the following we have um, one coming up which will be with um, I need to remember now. Uh, oh yeah, it will be with Block Shirts, where we will be talking about um, how Block Shirts work with Daniel Paramo and and Anthony Rubin. And we and before that, we were also we also planning a webinar with Roman Reed, who will be updating us about um, in, the Internet Identity Workshop in San Francisco, which is taking place the first week of October. And he will be giving us the highlights of what is happening there. And we also have 
Kalia and Infominer coming up in late October, maybe. We will see. And some other cool stuff from other people, as always. So I'm working and we're working on getting all that stuff done. If you want to be updated, as always, follow us on Twitter, Telegram, sign up to the newsletter, um, LinkedIn, all those channels uh, will help you to get all that information and to participate. And as, as I said, next one will be about IRW with Dermot Reed, and then we will have blog sets. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Alan, also for making time with us and sharing what you've learned so far about identity for Kiva with us. Thanks, Alice. Uh, thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone.